Notre Dame. In computational intelligence, we tend to mimic nature because nature knows best. So why not take that process that has created our brain, our decision-making tool, and apply it to our automated decision-makers? My name is Christina Georgieva, and today I want to take you on a journey through evolution, neural networks, and a hybrid approach of the two, where we can use evolutionary computation in order to create neural networks. Now, to some of you, this might be familiar. What is a neural network? To some of you, it might just be this buzzword that you keep hearing people talking about. In order to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm going to briefly introduce how neural networks work from a higher level. Some of you might be bored. I apologize for that. So neural networks try to simulate on a very basic level what our brains do. They actually know we're close to really what our brains do because our brains are a lot more complex. However, it's attempting to simulate the fact that we have... This is not working either. Is it... What is the pointy thing? This? Ah. We have nodes, so neurons, that are connected to one another through some sort of weight. So some sort of electromagnetic signal that's letting commun communication happen between neurons. So I, you've probably seen this picture as well if you've done any tutorials on neural networks or if you have explained them yourself before. What this means is that neural networks have multiple layers. A layer is something like this. We have an input layer, a hidden layer, then another hidden layer, and you can have as many hidden layers as we want, and then an output layer. So if we take the example of trying to determine if something is a cat or not a cat, you might have input data that looks like, how fluffy is this thing? That might be this node, but 0.5 fluffiness. The next node might be something like, how cute is this thing? This data would then go through these little connections, the weights, onto the next node. In this node, a calculation will take place. What this calculation is, is not important for today's topic, and it can differ depending on what you do. However, what's important here is that you're taking what came out of this node together with the values of these connections and outputting a new value here. And this carries on, so this is now the input to this node, and so on, until the end. At the end, this last layer, the output layer, will take this information and then interpret was this kind of fluffy thing a cat or not a cat. When we train the neural network, mm -hmm. we know that the thing that we've inputted is a cat. So we can then tell our network if it says it's not a cat, ah, you were wrong, that's not what I wanted, I expected a cat back. So we send this information back. And the most important thing that you need to take out of this slide is that when we're training the network, we are adapting these values, these connections, which we call weights. Now that we actually know what neural networks on a very high level look like, we can jump into today's topic, which is evolutionary computation. Now there's many evolutionary computation algorithms out there. And what makes them evolutionary is that they simulate Surprise! Evolution. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking to you about genetic algorithms. Why I have chosen genetic algorithms? Well, it's one of the more popular approaches because it is also the most similar to the Darwinian evolutionary theory. So if we take a look at a genetic algorithm, what makes it evolutionary are three steps. Mutation, crossover, and selection. If we think of genetics, we would have a sequence of genes, so multiple values, for example. If we expose these genes to radiation, for example, a gene might mutate. That means it changes in some way or another. The second thing, crossover, refers to reproduction. You have parent one, parent two, and then they create a child. 
This way we get genes from parent one and genes from parent two that make it into the child. The last thing is selection. That's what we commonly know as survival of the fittest. If you take a glow-in-the-dark cat, this cat is not likely to survive to the next generation. Because it can't hunt at night, because the mouse will just be like, <laughs> I saw you coming. But a cat with long nails that doesn't glow in the dark <coughs> would likely survive to the next generation, as it can catch the mouse. Now, in order to solve a problem using this genetic approach, we need to represent our problem as a sequence of genes. This is what we call an individual. So if we take our cat example, we once again have, we have this is what we call an individual. It's just a sequence of numbers, an array, a vector, however you want to think about it. Where the first value might represent the amount of cuteness. It seems like a low amount of cuteness, so probably not a cat. The second value might represent fluff, and so on and so forth. So now we can represent our problem as a set of attributes. And once we know how to do that, we can apply the evolutionary process to this. So I pretend that this is actually a two-dimensional vector here. It's supposed to be two dimensions. Uh, and then, if this represents our problem, so two values, in a two-dimensional setting, we can plot what we call a population, like in this picture. A population, like in humans or cats, a population is our genetic diversity. We have a population of humans, we have a population of cats. We initialize a set of individuals randomly across the solution space. This is an individual, this is an individual, and so on. Once we have this population that gives us nice genetic diversity, we apply the evolutionary process to it. Mutation, crossover, selection. And this happens over multiple generations. Because evolution doesn't just happen like this. It, is, it takes multiple generations, it takes millennia to happen. And at the end, we hope to turn this into this. What does that mean? Well, all our individuals are now surrounding this area over here. And that area is actually the best solution. In our case, the best cat. The non-glow-in-the-dark cat. And they have all moved towards this location because we're trying to evolve our best possible cat. But in order to really determine what is a good cat, we need to define what that is. So in our problem space, we need to decide what makes an individual a good individual. In our cat example, by the way, this is called a fitness function. In our cat example, we might have cuteness, fluff, world dominance, and hairballs. We most likely want to maximize cuteness and fluff and probably minimize world dominance in hairballs. So one possible fitness function for this might be cuteness plus fluff divided by world dominance in hairballs. And we try to maximize this value. We want this value to be bigger. A bigger value means a better cat. Unless you want a cat to take over the world with you, in which case you might want to maximize world dominance. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into our three steps. There are, various, there are various approaches to doing mutation, to doing crossover, and to doing selection. But I'm gonna talk about the simplest basic ones from the first genetic algorithm. Let's assume we want to do mutation in a random manner. So we choose a random gene to mutate, and we also mutate to that randomly. If we have this individual, and we mutate it. We mutated, in this case, the third value. Everything else remained the same, but this value completely changed. What that means is it allows us to explore our search space. So if you are familiar with other optimization algorithms, you might know the word exploration. If we go back to our two-dimensional space, we might have an individual over here, 
and now we mutated it. So this individual would end up down here. It means this individual now looks at new solutions that we might not have seen before. Because we're looking for the best solution after all, and having initialized our individuals in random locations doesn't mean that you will end up with the individual being initialized in the best location possible. The next step is crossover. So in this example, we have two parents. I want to point out that evolutionary algorithms are very inclusive of polyamorous relationships. I'm giving an example of two parents here, but you can have multiple parents, five parents if you want, with all the genes, fix them all. But it's a lot easier to draw two parents, so I will do that. There's parent number one and parent number two. The two have a good time, and then there's individual number three. You can see that the first value and the second last value are coming from the first individual. The rest of the values are coming from the second individual. What this allows us to do is explore our, uh, exploit our search space. We've explored it with mutation, and now we can exploit it, which is a terrible word for it, but that's what it's called in optimization. If we have our two-dimensional space, we have parent one and parent two, we end up with an individual somewhere in the middle. That means that we are now looking around solutions we already know for something slightly better that might be around us. This is quite useful when your individuals are already coming together towards a good solution, but the best solution might be just a little bit to the side. We don't want them to jump all over the place. We still want to learn something. And the last step is selection. Again, there's also various ways of doing selection, but the easiest one is called elitist selection, which is just take the thing that has the best fitness value and that is the result from our fitness function. In our cat case, we were maximizing the value that we resulted in. So the cuteness plus fluff divided by world dominance and hairballs. <coughs> so from these three individuals and their fitness values, this individual in the middle would win because it has the largest fitness value. That means that individual, non-glow-in-the-dark cat, will survive to the next generation. And we rinse and repeat. We keep doing this for multiple generations. So now that we know how evolutionary algorithms work, how on earth is this applicable to neural networks? Well, there are actually four answers to that, but I'm only going to really speak about one. However, I'll mention the other two to get the curiosity juices going if you want to read up a little bit more on this at some point. The first is evolving parameters. So neural networks themselves have certain values that tell the neural network how much to do something by, how many layers do I want. And these parameters can be optimized so that you can get the best possible value for your neural network to solve the problem you're trying to solve. Not the most interesting approach because, well, you have other options for this. You can also evolve input features. So you might have a certain problem where the data that you're using in your neural network is not so obvious like, what would be useful there. In this particular case, especially if you have a very large amount of data, so by that I mean many types of features, you might want to evolve which features are actually useful for this particular neural network. So your individual would look something like ones and zeros, where one means use this feature, and zero means don't use this feature. The third option is evolving the architecture. So we had all those layers and all those connections. The, that's the architecture of the neural network. So how many layers do we have? How many hid hidden nodes are there inside those layers? How are those connected? So what are the weight values inside them? This gets quite complex because it goes into what's called genetic programming. And that's evolutionary algorithms for evolving trees, which means you have to remove some nodes, add some new nodes, and so on. So individuals change sizes. So we're not gonna get into that now, either. So all the, all the red ones we won't, we won't get into. But evolving weights, that one's pretty fun. So that's what I'm gonna present to you about that today. So remember the weights are those connections between the different nodes, those connections that have values. And there are two things in the evolutionary algorithm which we already know about, 
that we need to change in order to fit to <coughs> our problem. So there are only two things that are problem specific. The individual, that's the representation of your problem. And the fitness, that's how well does this individual fit to the problem you're trying to solve. <coughs> so it's actually pretty easy because your individual is just a list of values and what are weights? Well, just numerical values. So if we take this neural network, we can see this weight over here would be the first value. This one over here, the second value, and so on. So you just need to create a list that represents these weights, and then you need a way to map from that list to this existing architecture. Then the fitness value needs to check how well this neural network does in your cat or not cat problem. So you've mapped now the individual to these weights. You take a set of data, you throw it through the network, and you get your result, cat or not cat. You know what you expect. You know you expect a cat now, or you expect no cat now. So now you can measure, okay, how many times did I get this correctly? Or something a little bit more advanced, the F1 score of each one of the classes, divided by maybe the standard deviation between those two. Like any approach, this has its advantages and disadvantages. The first advantage I've put here, and it's mainly because I really like this picture, I think it's the best thing on the internet, <laughs> other than cats, of course, as you might have noticed, I like those two. <laughs> so the first advantage is that you can actually use less data. Now, how much less? <laughs> that depends on your problem. Like in any question, how much data do you really need? Uh, but if we think about how we train a neural network, you take a set of data, and you take it through the network, and then you know what you expect, and then send that information back to adjust those weights. Then you have another set of data that it has not seen before, in order to check, well, does this network actually solve the problem in general, or does it only know the data that I fed it to train it? So if I teach my child what a strawberry is, that a strawberry is a fruit, if the child knows that a strawberry is a fruit after I've told them, well, yeah, you're kind of proud, but not really. But if the child knows that an apple is a fruit because you taught them a strawberry is a fruit, ah, then you're really proud, then you're like, yes, my child can generalize. <laughs> so this is what you want to check with your second set of data. When it comes to evolutionary algorithms, you don't need the training set to be as big, because you're not training. You just need a data set that you use in your fitness function to determine is this individual good or not. So that set can be smaller. You then still need your second set because you still need to check that you understand an apple and not just strawberries. So please don't forget that second set. The second advantage is that it's less likely to get stuck. Now, this is what you find in the research papers. And a lot of the current approaches to neural networks, such as gradient descent, are likely to get stuck in what's called local optimum or local minimum. So if we see this, ex this example picture here. <coughs> in gradient descent, this dot is trying to go down. But then it gets stuck because it can't go further down. But your best, best solution is down here. With evolutionary algorithms, you're less likely to get stuck over here. Less likely does not mean it can't happen. <laughs> Keep this in mind. Because optimization algorithms can also get stuck. And the last advantage is that you have custom evaluation. You have all the power in your fitness function. You now can do all kinds of things in there. It's free to you. You put some stuff through the neural network, and then you can have 10 kinds of measurements that you use in order to determine, yes, this is the network that I want for my problem. So you have a lot of more power to guide the network to be more suitable to the business case that you're trying to solve. There are also disadvantages, like with anything. The first is that you might need some special needs from certain libraries. There is already a library for training neural networks using evolutionary computation. It's called NEAT, N-E-A-T. And you can already use this out of the box. However, your business case might require, you might limit you to certain library. Maybe you need to deploy this on a mobile device, so you can only use certain libraries like TensorFlow. 
In such a case, you will probably need to use the, an evolutionary computation library together with your library for the neural network, because you can then just call this in your fitness function. So it doesn't matter what you're using there. But then you need to make sure that the library for the neural network actually exposes the weights and allows you to set these values, because in the end, that's what you're evolving. The second disadvantage is that it might be quite slow. For every generation, for every individual, you need to calculate the fitness. That means you need to shove a bunch of data through the neural network that you've created in order to measure how well you're doing with it. So if your problem is rather simple, you probably don't need a neural network, but if you do need a neural network for your very simple problem, you probably don't need this, unless you have one of ah, these things to solve. The third disadvantage, and I will move here because I'm covering it, is that you have a lot of parameters. Sure, we've eliminated the parameters you need for training your network, but we still have some of the parameters for the network, what is the architecture, and we still have now new parameters for the evolutionary algorithm. So you need to keep this in mind. Now, you probably already have some automated ways to optimize your parameters, in which case this is not a problem for you. So, in conclusion, you can train or evolve neural networks by using evolutionary algorithms, and you might be able to use less data, or most likely, and you're less likely to get stuck. This is also, uh, once again, in the way of my slides, a field called neuroevolution, and it is starting to get more popular in deep learning. So if you like big buzzwords like deep learning, check it out. There is an O'Reilly podcast, so if you search for O'Reilly podcast, neuroevolution, you will this and how it is being applied in uh, deep learning. Oh yes, and you got a chance to see how to evolve a cat, so it's good. <laughs>